Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q3 FY23 Earnings Conference Call of CoForge Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ankur Agarwal, Head Investor Relations and M&A at CoForge Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Kazan. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today for CoForge Q3 FY23 Earnings Conference Call. As you are aware, we announced our Q3 results today. These have been filed with the stock exchanges and they are also available on the investors section of our website, www.cofos.com. I have with me today our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh, our CFO, Mr. Ajay Kalra, and our Chief Customer Success Officer, Mr. John Spate. As always, we'll start with the opening remarks from our CEO and post that will open the floor for your comments and questions. With that, I would now like to hand it over to our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh. Sudhir, all yours. Thank you, Uncle. Uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to all of you across the world, folks. At the outset, uh, let me wish all of you a very healthy, happy, and a meaningful new year. With that, I shall now share our quarter three fiscal year 23 performance and the business outlook. Q3 this year has been a very strong quarter for the firm, despite the fact that it was the shortest quarter and a furlough-ridden quarter. In this quarter, we signed five large deals, which is the highest number of large deals signed in any quarter in the history of our firm. Our quarterly order intake for the firm, again, has been the highest regarded ever in our history. Our utilization this quarter jumped 300 bits sequentially, our attrition levels came down further to 15.8% and they are probably now one of the lowest or the lowest across the industry. And finally, this quarter, our 12-month executable signed order book stands at $841 million and that again is the highest ever. With that overall context, I shall now talk you through the results, the quarterly performance and our assessment of the outlook. Moving on with the quarterly performance, revenue analysis. I'm pleased, very pleased to report that during the quarter, the firm registered a sequential revenue growth of 3.7% in constant currency terms. In USD and INR terms, the growth was 2% and 4.9% respectively. That 170 bits difference between the constant currency and dollar growth was on account of 70 bits of hedge losses and 100 bits came from cross-currency headwinds. On a YTD basis, at the end of the first nine months of the current fiscal, the firm has grown 22.9% in CC terms, 24.6% in INR terms, and 16.3% in USD terms. On a YOY basis, the firm has grown 20.7% in CC terms, 24% in INR terms, and 13.6% in USD terms. I shall now detail vertical-wise growth for the quarter under review. During this quarter, the BFS vertical grew by 39.3% year-on-year in CC terms and contributed 31.1% to the total revenue. The strong growth came despite the impact of very considerable softness in our BPS mortgage portfolio. Our travel vertical grew 25.6% year on year in CC terms, and it contributed 19.3% to the revenue mix. The insurance vertical revenue declined by 6.8% YOY in CC terms and contributed 22.1% to the Q3 revenue. The other's vertical grew by 24.1% YOY in CC terms and contributed 27.4% to the revenue mix. 
within the other vertical retail and healthcare now stand at about 8% of global company revenue and the public sector outside india stands at around 7% these two verticals are the probable next two global verticals that the firm will carve out over time within the geographies the americas contributed 49.2% india contributed 40.3% and the rest of the world contributed 10.5% of the revenue. The farming engine of the firm continues to drive the growth of our top customer relationships. We continue to very successfully mine our key client relationships under a structured enterprise-wide key accounts program. In quarter three, our top five customers grew 5.4% sequentially and top 10 customers grew 3.5% sequentially in US dollar terms. Our top five clients contribute now 23.9% to our aggregate revenues, while the top 10 contribute 36.3%. We see the current state of our top 10 client relationships offering two distinct advantages to us. First, as you would have noticed, we are not overly reliant on or overly concentrated in any single client relationship. Second, we expect to significantly expand our wallet share in the top 10 clients given the clear success that our key accounts program has driven for us in the recent quarters. The offshore revenue saw a further pickup and crossed the 50% mark, representing 50.5% of the total revenue in quarter three. You will recall that just nine quarters ago, in quarter two FY21, offshore revenue was only 36% of the firm's revenue. This has been a structural shift in the firm's operating profile and an important and sustainable margin lever. To that, I shall now move on to the margins and the operating profits discussion. Talking about quarterly performance margins and operating profits. Our Q3 gross margin sequentially increased by 133 bits to 33.4%. The significant increase in gross margin in Q3 came about because of one, offshore revenue contribution increase, two, a 300 bits improvement in utilization, and three, continued increase in billing of graduate engineer trainees hired directly from college. We believe that the structural shift in the gross margin profile of the firm augurs well for an increased margin gradient in the years to come. It takes considerable effort to effect a 14% swing in offshore revenue contribution, which we have done. Again, it takes considerable effort to build a campus hiring engine at scale, which is now in full play at CoForge, and it took considerable effort to move the needle on utilization by 300 bits in a seasonally short furlough ridden quarter, which is what we've achieved. Today, as we speak, we have another thousand graduate engineer trainees who are undergoing training. And as they become available over the next four quarters, that should provide a further gross margin fill. It is important to note that our gross margin increase has been driven by these three efficiency levers that I've noted above and not, I repeat, not by currency tailwinds. The entire tailwind on margins on account of rupee depreciation was wiped away by the hedge losses sustained during the quarter. That hedge loss of INR 129 million during the quarter created a headwind of 60 bits on the margins. As we've shared in the last two quarterly calls, we are investing aggressively, and I mean aggressively, in the front-end leadership and capability build to further drive accelerated growth. As a result of those investments, SGNA as a percentage of the revenue for the quarter was 14.9%. That's almost 121 bits increase over Q2 FY23. Despite these very significant investments, Adjusted EBITDA margin increased to 18.5% for the quarter. The consolidated profit after tax for the quarter, for at Indian rupees 2,282 million, 
which reflected an YOI increase of 24.2% in INR terms. Moving on to water intake, interesting story, water intake. The shortest quarter of the year has proved to be the most productive for the firm, both in terms of the number of large deals and the order intake registered. We closed five large deals during the quarter, which is the highest number ever recorded in the history of our firm. One of these was a $50 million plus deal within the insurance vertical. Our order intake of $345 million during the quarter was again the highest quarterly intake for the firm. The $50 million plus TCB deal was structured with a specialty insurance carrier to support its core systems upgrade as well as servicing and building capabilities in newer areas of operations. Another 30 million TCB deal was signed with the banking major. This deal was anchored by our data and analytics service line and involves advanced analytics in financial crime and fraud management, BI reporting, and platform organization for the next three years. America has contributed $208 million, EMEA $113 million, and the rest of the world $24 million to the overall order intake. On executable order book, which reflects the total value of locked orders over the next 12 months, stands at a record high of $841 million compared to $802 million in the previous quarter. This metric, which we track closely and have reported quarterly over the last five plus years, is also indicative of strong expected growth beyond just the current fiscal year. We also signed 11 new logos during the quarter. Moving on to the people metrics. At the end of quarter three, total headcount stood at 22,505. The quarter saw an increase in utilization by 300 bits, and as a consequence, we were able to deliver the volumes with a marginal decrease of 138 people in tech services. Attrition during the quarter further declined to 15.8% in Q3 from 16.4% in Q2. Employee attrition at CoFord, and I've said this often, continues to remain amongst the lowest and probably is the lowest across the IT services industry. I will now hand over the call to John Speak. Chief Customer Success Officer for providing insights into our operations and capability creation. John joined the firm around five years back shortly after I did, and I've had the pleasure of having him as my colleague over the past 12 years across organizations. He currently drives our customer success function and oversees key accounts growth and consulting capability build agenda. Over to you, John. Thank you, Sadea. I will now touch briefly on our key delivery operation highlights. As you, as you are aware, effective delivery execution has and continues to be a core part of our customer value proposition. In our insurance business, we successfully implemented an automated underwriting solution for a large US-based customer. This resulted in significant reduction in time taken to issue policies and the corresponding reduction in their cost base. For a global specialty insurance group with offices across US, South America, UK and Europe, we've been chosen as their global strategic partner to work with them in their digital transformation program. This encompasses the run, the build and transformation across all of their systems and will leverage our end-to-end -end services spanning capabilities such as consulting, digital, data, analytics, cloud and automation. Before I move on from insurers, I just want to, to let you know that we were recognized for the first time in the recent Everest Peak Matrix for application and digital services in both PMC and LNA insurance segments. We were classified as a star performer in the major contender segment, a significant achievement for us. Moving on to banking and financial services, we have successfully completed a very large transition from the incumbent provider at a tier one bank. With the transition completed, we've now embarked on transforming the delivery to outcome-based service models. The partnership with this bank has grown on the back of our delivery excellence, and we're moving up the value chain. One such example is the modernization of their business intelligence platforms that provide advanced analytics services in areas such as financial crime and fraud protection. In travel, transport and hospitality business, 
We've successfully partnered with one of the global airlines to improve their customer experience when using kiosks. We've now rolled out the new kiosk platform at 25 airports worldwide and are currently planning to roll up for a further 20 airports. The new kiosks support 12 different languages and have helped improve the customer experience by significantly reducing the self-service check-in time. We continue to explore and invest in emerging technologies. Our Metaverse COE is now operational. The CoForge Metaverse Experience Center is a virtual reality space that is being used to demonstrate use cases across the industries. We've also embarked on a program to use the Metaverse for our leadership simulation programs and employee onboarding here at CoForge. It's a great way to deliver value while we build up our Metaverse capabilities. Finally, we recently announced a partnership with the Mac Institute for Innovation Management at the Wharton Business School. The Mac Institute supports both industry and academic communities, helping to apply innovation research into real-world deployable solutions. This partnership will help reinforce our efforts to enhance our technology capabilities and to help us deliver value-added solutions to our customers. I would now like to hand over to AJ for further details on financials. Thank you, John. <clears throat> A very happy new year to everyone. Let me briefly touch upon the key to the balance sheet and tax metrics. Our cash and bank balances at the end of Q3 financial year 23 stood at $49.5 million compared to previous quarter. Uh, compared to previous quarter. Uh, sorry about that. There's some audio uh, issues. Uh, let me begin again. Uh, let me briefly uh, touch upon the key balance sheets and tax metrics. Our cash and bank balances at the end of Q3 uh, financial year 23 stood at $49.5 million compared to previous quarter of $50.3 million. CapEx spend during the quarter was $5 million. Uh, the state, uh, day's day, uh, sales outstanding was 73 days in Q3 versus 70 days in Q2 in INR terms. In USD terms, the DSO was 68 days compared to 66 days in Q2. Uh, the effective tax rate for Q3 financial year 23 was at 23.3% as compared to 17.7% in Q2. You may recollect that we had one-time benefit last quarter that we got from one of our foreign subsidiaries where we were able to take the benefit of net operating losses. Our normalized tax rate for Q3 is around 21.5%, and our ETR will continue to be in the range of 21 to 22%. The operating cash flow for the three months ended 31st December 2022 was at $30.4 million, which is about 69% of EBITDA. The OCS and DSO were impacted due to collection of one of our large clients coming in the first week of January and impacted the DSO by five days. In addition, I just wanted to give an update also on the company's proposed ADR offering. The current market conditions are not favorable and hence ADR listing has been delayed. Though the company remains fully committed to the ADR listing, the company continues to monitor market conditions closely. With that, I will hand over uh, the call back to Sudhir for his comments on outlooks. Thank you very much, uh, Ajay. Uh, let me move on with the summing up in the output section, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. The five large teams signed during the quarter, the highest order intake, and I said this earlier, in the history in any quarter in the history of the firm. And finally, the highest 12 month signed order book in the history of the firm at the current point in time gives us confidence in our ability to drive sustained, robust growth in the coming quarter and in the coming year, despite the uncertain macros. The fact that the farming engine across the accounts is delivering sustained, deepest, robust growth the change in our client portfolio mix where we today have 60 plus 
Forbes Global Housing Client Relationships to farm further. The aggressive, very aggressive investments in sales, marketing, tech, and functional capability build that we are making, allied with an improving margin gradient that allows us to invest further, gives us further confidence in that assertion that I just made. As a consequence, we are now upgrading our full year revenue guidance to 22% organic CC growth and we maintain our adjusted EBITDA annual margin guidance. To those words and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my prepared remarks and I look forward to hearing your comments and to addressing your questions. Back to you, folks. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants connected on video link, please click on raise and icon to ask a question. Participants connected on audio, please press star and one to ask a question. We will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Ravi Menon from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you, gentlemen. Rails on a pretty good quarter. Uh, so you, you said that there were significant headwinds in BPM, but despite that, you uh, seem to have grown there. Uh, so you know, this mortgage was a headwind. Uh, what are the other parts of BPO that actually did grow? No, I said that there were significant uh, headwinds in BPS mortgage, BPO mortgage, Ravi. And the numbers that I called out were for the BFS portfolio, which includes the BFS BPS portfolio. So the mortgage business saw a considerable decline, but given the very significant momentum that we have ongoing across our broader BFS portfolio, it continues to power ahead with the speed that it has been over the past few quarters. Oh, thanks, Will. but I was saying that specifically BPM itself seems to have grown, uh, you know, from like 25.7 million to 28.8 million. Uh, so are there parts of BPM uh, that is still growing out? That's BPM is growing, but it's, uh, I mean, uh, as the pieces or the aspects of BPM, the parts of the business across BPM, which are not on the market side, are doing very well. We talked about this in the earlier calls as well, Ravi. The cross set is moving very well. We've been able to make forays into the travel BPO space. We've been able to very aggressively start getting into the analytics space, which is an allied area. We've been able to cross sell very effectively. Uh, in the insurance space with the BPS offerings, which for the acquired entity SLK were initially only on the BFS side. Interestingly, in this quarter, the BPM business also signed a $20 million plus deal. So one of the five large deals that I talked about was a BPM-led deal that we closed. Did I answer your question? Yeah, great. Thank you. And one more follow-up on this, uh, you know, so this line data integration, you know, that uh, seemed to have done really well over the last uh, year or so. But this particular quarter, we've seen a decline there. I mean, is there furloughs or some projects coming to an end? Uh, how should we see this? Um, most of the business right now on the data side is with BFS. There were very significant furloughs this uh, this quarter in the BFS clients that we saw. That's why you see a temporary blip. Data analytics, we feel very, very good about. It's really scaled up multiples over the last two or three years. And we see that growth continuing, hopefully accelerating here. Great. Thanks so much and best luck. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vibor Singhal from New Arm Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Monica. Thanks for taking my question and congrats on the very strong deal flow uh, in the previous product this quarter. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, on the deal flow itself, uh, if I could get uh, some color on, uh, uh, as you mentioned, there was a $50 million deal that we worked in the insurance segment. Uh, would it be possible to provide some breakup of the $345 million? I mean, how uh, was it uh, in terms of vertical? Uh, 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 what would be the number from banking, from travel, and from the other verticals? 
So before I, I, I provide some numbers around the geos, uh, I can give you some more color around the five Ds and where they came from. Two out of the five Ds were yeah. from the insurance vertical, which we suspect starting Q4 is going to rebound smartly. Uh, one of them was a DNA data analytics led deal from the BFS space. The fourth came in from the BPM uh, profile that I talked about. So that's broadly where four out of those five deals came from. Uh, the GOI split is what I've given you. If, if I look at the current yeah. quarter, that the quarter that got over, most of the large deals were centered around the BFSI space. So they came almost evenly from insurance and from the banking. Got it, got it. Uh, that's really helpful. I also just wanted to pick your brains on the guidance part. So we've upgraded our guidance uh, in this quarter and maintained the guidance for the margins also. And if, uh, I mean, uh, in this quarter, of course, uh, 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 the growth was impacted because of the seasonally soft quarter. Uh, given the numbers that we have, that leaves a very really tall laugh for Q4, both in terms of growth and margins. Uh, margins, I know you mentioned that uh, we decided to uh, spend more on the uh, in the part this time, which uh, the, uh, can uh, be uh, recovered next quarter in itself. But I think on the growth part, the required rate for the next quarter comes out to be quite steep. So, I mean, is this uh, the deal flow that we got in this quarter that's giving us the confidence or uh, the overall momentum that you are seeing? And a related question to that is uh, slightly a little bit of a longer term. I mean, how do you see, uh, uh, again, the next uh, your couple of quarters play out? Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, the uh, U.S. possibly heading into a slowdown, uh, how the client conversations have been around that, and how do you see that deal mix changing because of that? Oh, yeah, let me take the questions in order. The first one was uh, a question around the growth that we anticipate in Q4. The guidance that we give is growth, and we've always given consistency is in uh, organic constant currency growth. At the end of the first nine months, YTD, the firm is already growing 22.9%. So the 22%, at least 22% constant currency growth guidance by our estimates is a, is a relatively conservative guidance. We believe that we only need to grow in CC terms 3.5% to get there. And clearly, given the momentum that we have, given the five deals that we've signed, given that we've just grown 3.7% in a shorter seasonally week, although driven quarter where mortgage industry was also uh, seeing a very significant drawdown, gives us confidence that uh, we should be able to meet and exceed the annual 22% CC guidance that we talked about. So that's, that's answer one to question one that came from you. Uh, the second question from you was, uh, how do we see the, uh, the somewhat longer term play out? And I did call that out in the, in the commentary that I talked about towards the end. This is a good time in the year. Uh, and I, we actually at Coco believe it's also a good time in the industry when the world is looking at uncertain macros to actually lean into growth. That has underpinned our very strong, very committed, very aggressive investments in sales, marketing, capability build, and you've seen that in the current quarter itself. So given the five deals, which will now start ramping up, I suspect we'll start seeing the impact effectively from Q1 of next year. This, this quarter is likely to be a transition. We feel that despite the uncertain macros, despite the fact that there is a lot of ambient noise around what may or may not happen, we've been able to start, start insulating ourselves from a lot of that conversation. The order executable, I told you, is the highest ever. The order intake was the highest ever. The number of large deals have been the highest ever. So clearly there's a good ramp for the next few quarters, which hopefully will insulate us even if some of the worst case scenarios are playing out, and we should continue to be on what we've always called out as robust growth. And I think it's going to be a very good time for us to prove that we can deliver sustained growth even in the market terms. So looking forward to it, we'll see what, what happens, but we feel good about the future. Got it, got it. Great. Thank you so much for taking my question, and wish you all the Thanks very much, Ugo. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha Agarwal from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, hi, congrats on a good quarter for these. A couple of questions are, our deals in insurance has been pretty strong, but somehow that is not reflected in growth. For the last few quarters, insurance has been on a soft trajectory. So do you see there's a delay in deal con getting converted into revenue, or is there something else which is holding back growth rates in insurance, that is question number one. 
and then I'll, I'll answer the question. Incident Sandra, uh, quarter four, which is the quarter that we're already in, we should see the clear turnaround. And, and uh, that vertical, that business for us, uh, get back onto a path that it should be. You're absolutely right, this quarter we closed two large deals. We had a large deal closure, if I remember correctly, in the previous quarter as well. It takes a little bit of a time to transition these deals, to lean into these deals. But Q4, the quarter we are in, insurance should be exactly where it's been for us over the last four, four and a half years. Did you have a follow-up, Sadhan? The line for Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Shraddha Agarwal has got disconnected. We'll move on to the next question from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital, please unmute your audio from your side and proceed with your question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congrats on strong performance. Uh, Sujit, I'm sure you would share the precise guidance for FI24 in April, but just to understand the maths now, based on your 12-month order book, that is up 20%, and also based on multiple conversations with the client and potential pipeline that the company is chasing, is it safe to assume that we may be able to replicate the current growth momentum at least for next two, three quarters, if not beyond? It's a, it's a tricky question, and I think you know that yourself, Rahul, as you posed it. Uh, we feel good, and I'm saying this again, and I don't say this if we did not really feel good about uh, where things stand, right? It's always a very sweet spot to be in when you can get into quarter four. The new, the new year is about to start, and you have tailwind of five large deals, which will really start delivering from quarter one of next year. Uh, clearly, there is a buffer. You've talked about it. The order executable being at 845 million, the order intake being at 345 odd million that we've looked at. So, the way I would characterize it is uh, I mean, one doesn't know the future, but everything that we could have done to insulate ourselves from a deteriorating or a significantly deteriorated macro in the quarters to come, we seem to have done a fair bit of it. We feel, given our size, we're certainly not a large-scale IT player. We should be a billion-dollar IT services firm. Growth is as much a function of the ability of the firm to rest wallet share, especially when things are slowing down, by leaning into that opportunity, as it is about what is the rate at which the broader market is growing. The broad market is way too big. We still have a very small piece in that sandbox. We think as things change, we should be able to expand wallet share and we should be able to drive what I will for now characterize as robust growth. Hopefully robust growth despite the macro is going up and down. And I'll leave it there, uh, Rahul. I know it doesn't answer the question completely, but that's how I would present it. Uh, maybe <clears throat> uh, so just a, a suggestion which may help uh, a lot of us is that I, I, I really appreciate that you came out with your first ever guidance at the most uncertain time, uh, you know, and which uh, somewhere says that you have uh, some slight uh, as in an important word, word you always keep is like at least uh, in your guidance, which is also a rare thing to see, which clearly says you have a certain grip or understanding or visibility uh, on the kind of an outlook that you share. So uh, what if uh, we could, you know, uh, can think of giving guidance on a 12 month forward rolling basis rather than giving an annual guidance? Because that guidance at the beginning of the year is far more uh, supportive of the thought, but as the year progresses, I mean, having a guidance for Q4 now is not helping as much as it was helping me uh, earlier. So maybe that's a different aspect which uh, we could work it uh, over a period of time. Just a small suggestion. Thank you. No, I think it's a, it's a great, it's a fantastic suggestion, Rahul. Thank you very much for that. And you're absolutely right. The first time we started giving guidance was around the time that COVID stuck and we had very significant exposure to the travel industry. And which is why we thought it was imperative that we like to think we have a very strong execution engine and a very strong grip on the business that we step up to the plate and offer that guidance. I take your point. The only, the only, uh, the only uh, response I will have to you is over the last five years, if you look at us, 
every quarter we call out the next 12 months for the book, right? Which is what we call out as order executable. And if you look at our growth over the last five years, over the last 20 quarters, there's been a very strong correlation between the graph, the order executable graph, and the actual revenue recorded over the next 12 months. So while we can't, and you will appreciate this, while we can't keep on giving a 12 month forecast, we do try to give some comfort, some indication around how much is already locked in. And, and I think we have not just a fairly, I'd like to say a very good record in terms of a very strong correlation between the OE movement and the actual revenue that comes over the next 12 months. So I'll leave you with that part, but, but, I, but I take your, but I take your suggestion, and I think it's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha Agrawal from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Sorry, no, sorry, I got dropped off. Just another question on BSS. Uh, some large uh, IT names have expressed some concerns on capital markets. So, from that perspective, what is our positioning in capital market and overall BSS, and how do we see macros playing out in that segment? So capital market buy side, especially asset and wealth management from our vantage side, has always been a good happy hunting area. The big change that's happened uh, within our BFS portfolio, what's actually driven growth for us, really stemmed from that $105 million four-year, eight-month deal that we've announced about a year and a half back. The very significant ramp up in that bank, the very, very significant ramp up in some of the other top 10 relationships that we have. So if I were to look at it, if I were to start characterizing how we look at BFS, we still see spend even on the capital markets buy side when it comes to enterprise-wide modernization. We see a lot of interest coming in around low-code, no-code, and we see data solutions still in demand. So as we see it, and if I were a betting person, we would still like to say that for the next few quarters, irrespective of the macros, irrespective of what we're already picking up, Irrespective of the fact that BFS, we've seen very significant furloughs in the quarter that closed, that momentum from a co-forged BFS business perspective should sustain. We've seen nothing as a leading indicator, given the pipeline that we have, the locked orders that we have to indicate that it will go down. That's how I would put it. There are there are issues, there are headwinds, but then given the momentum we have getting into that, we think good about where we are and we think it is likely to sustain. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. That's good to hear. Another thing is of the five large deals that we closed this quarter, was any deal uh, uh, driven by any vendor consolidation exercise taken by any large account? And were we uh, you know, on the favorable side of it or any cost takeout deal in the pipeline, the increasing intensity of cost takeout deals versus transformational deals? Anything on the deal pipeline and the deal closure uh, with respect to vendor consolidation if you can talk about? Yeah, I'm just reflecting on it as you speak. Uh, the $50 million deal was a clear window of consolidation. Uh, and that came in, if I remember right, in about 55 over three years. And that was a win. That was a clear win. Uh, the BPM deal was, uh, again, interesting. Smallest deal, but very material for us, $24 million deal. That, again, was a window of consolidation. Uh, Cost is increasingly at play. John, you might want to add some perspective here, but in almost all of these five, cost and transportation seem to be going hand in hand. Uh, and transformation at any point. Uh, John, over to you for your comments. Thank you, Sudhir. Um, yeah, I mean, we are seeing an increased interest in, in cost optimization programs. Uh, obviously, vendor consolidation is one of those levers that can be applied. Um, and, I expect to see more and more um, use cases around around co uh, costs coming through. We also see an awful lot of um, um, interest around process efficiency. Again, looking to drive down um, to, to automate and reduce cost through efficiencies. I see. All right. Thank you. Thank you. If I can okay. give one last question. Uh, so your margin guidance, uh, according to my calculation, still implies a 200 bits plus sequential improvement that is required in 4Q to even get to the lower end of the um, guidance band. So uh, what do you think are the levers available to us to bring to have such a, a sharp uh, you know, uh, margin improvement exercise to happen in 4Q? Yes, yeah, so if, you, if you reflect back, uh, the first two quarters of this year, our margins were higher than the first two quarters of the previous year. 
Last year, our quarter for margin always has a variant. Last year, our quarter for margin was 20.4%. We need to add 170 bits over quarter three in quarter four to get to the lower end of the guidance. At the current point in time, we feel good about it. And I'll tell you why. We feel good about it. A, because there was a 100 bits impact in the current quarter because of the mortgage drawdown. A lot of our mortgage business is transaction linked. There is a lag by, uh, between the volumes going down and the cost being taken out. The cost is now nearly out, corresponding to the lower volumes. So that 100 bits is a natural flow that we will get getting into next, next quarter. The other pieces, again, are the specific around the GEP numbers that we have. I talked during my commentary around the fact that we have a thousand GEPs are now getting built, uh, which is the second lever that comes in. And the third lever, of course, will continue to be a modicum of operating leverage that we've always got around Martin. So our calculation shows we need to go up by about 170 bits. Uh, and we feel that we should be able to do it. We need to deliver about 19.7. Last year, we delivered 20.4 in quarter four. Uh, given the fact that the offshore engine has scaled up far more than it was at the same time Q4 last year, we feel we will deliver. And that's why we made the discussion that we will deliver on it. Just to add here, somehow my calculation shows that we need to get to 20.8% margin in 4Q, which is a 230 bits improvement. So is this discrepancy because of uh, your guidance being in constant currency and we looking at dollar terms, uh, sorry, we looking at reported EBITDA margin? Just want to get a confirmation on the margin guidance. Ajay, do you want to address that? <clears throat> Yes, yeah, Sudhir. So uh, this is uh, thank you, Sudhir. So uh, Shraddha, this is our calculation. Uh, the the uh, margin uptake that is required is 170 with uh, basis points. It's between actually between 150 to 170 basis points, depending upon where our revenues would go. Uh, since uh, there is an uptake of the revenues uh, from quarter three to quarter four, uh, that will also help us improve the margin from a peer perspective as well. So you need to factor that as well uh, while calculating the, the margin uptake. We, uh, we can uh, uh, talk so in that if there's a, offline. Yeah, if, if, uh, if, if we, can, uh, we can have a follow-up uh, with you on, on uh, the exact calculations and, uh, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Ajay. Yeah. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishi Junjunwala from IFL Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, Sudhir, uh, you know, a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, on the margin side, right? So if you really look at it um, over the past five, six years, uh, you know, our gross margins have uh, continuously trended down, even if, uh, you know, even though we have delivered industry leading growth. And you have recently talked about, uh, you know, the uh, you know expansion on the gross margin side in the near term as well. I know to some extent it was also in the last two years uh, because of uh, the pain on the travel and hospitality side. But just wanted to understand if you really look at, um, you know, us um, going, uh, you know, up in terms of the margin bands, um, where do you think the gross margin profile ideally should be and and do we have those levers or is it structurally that we are going to remain around uh, these levels so if you look at this quarter we walked the talk right I mean, the talk that you heard from us over the last two or three quarters we walked it our gross margin has jumped sequentially by 133 bits and and and, and we believe very strongly it's going to jump again sequentially in quarter four over quarter three so uh, your question is valid but I would point you to our numbers for the current quarter. This quarter, gross margin has jumped very significantly. It's now at 33.4 from 32 last quarter. Uh, and we believe we're going to be certainly north of 33.4. I mean, if I were a betting man, I'd say more than 34 for sure in quarter four. So I, I hear you. All I'd say is just look at current quarter, we walk the top. Understood. The other question is, uh, you know, if we look at the trajectory of your uh, year on year growth in executable order book for the last three quarters, we have seen some bit of acceleration from 16 to 20 um, from 1Q to uh, 3Q. And this is despite the fact that uh, during this uh, period, the mark, you know, the overall macro has continued to become worse or at least sentimentally worse. 
um and if i look at it from the perspective of uh, you know where your next 12 months or fy24 growth could be even at 15% growth uh, it would uh, imply that your executable order book as a proportion is probably one of the highest that we have seen in the past 4 uh, 5 years so just wanted to understand um, you know um in terms of uh, conversion of this order book into um, you know revenues how much of it would be dependent on um, you know macro not becoming significantly worse or the other way to put it is uh, what could be the risk to this revenue conversion if at all no risk to the revenue conversion this is locked in order rishi what we call out every quarter 12 month locked in orders right this is not a pipeline this is what's already locked in the risk really remains between the revenue that we going for versus what we already have locked in so very rarely do we find that what's already locked in kind of washes away if you were to go back and look at the order executable that we end in year with and the actual revenue that we recognize i i i would disagree with that assertion that getting to 15% means that we have to significantly up what we already have i think the order executable that we are at currently mathematically nobody knows how it's going to pan out in the future should make 15% a slam dunk for the future yeah no i was actually asking the other way around that it looks like you will definitely do at least that that much so was there a risk to that that's, that's what i was referring to maybe so, that's okay. a compliment that i did not grasp yes yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> no we we yeah. we i mean we like to hope that we will uh, yeah. and 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 i obviously been trying to words with my way out of here by talking about robust growth sustained growth um we always had robust growth sustained growth for the last two or three years you can and i know that you know our revenue growth numbers over the last three years we still think despite the ambient noise despite macros which even the best case are likely to deteriorate somewhat uh we got enough of a tailwind to be able to push into the storm if a storm does arise and do and still deliver that robust Uh, robust growth transition. That's that's about all I can say, and I know you you understand that. But we feel good about it. There's there's just a lot of good tailwind. There's a there's momentum building up at the right time right now, as we see. Yeah. Yeah. fair enough and one last uh, question can you give some color on uh, advantage go i mean it it's clearly um, has been a differentiated product on the insurance side historically it's done really well just wanted to understand where it is uh, you know how do you think about it uh, um, you know progressing over the next couple of years are there any changes required in terms of uh, you know growth or positioning of that product Yeah, uh, we we realized about uh, six months to nine months, two to three quarters back, uh, Rishi, that uh, we definitely needed change within that business. Uh, that business has not been growing at the pace that the rest of the organization has, to the extent that now it's like likely just about one, maybe one point two, one point three percent. I'll just keep you honest on this of our aggregate revenues, right? Also, uh, this quarter, when I say this quarter, I mean quarter three. We onboarded Ian Summers, who was the CEO of Seacool. Our, our biggest competitor, our principal competitor in that same London Lloyd's reinsurance market, he's now become the business leader. He's the person who's going to be driving this now in the London Lloyd's reinsurance, the Bermuda, and the US market going forward. So, long story short, abbreviating my answer, we recognize the fact that we needed a fresh pair of eyes to look at the business. We recognize the fact that that business was actually pulling the firm down, and I'm not talking down in absolute terms, but in relative terms. And that we needed to relook at it. Last quarter, I talked about the fact that we relaunched our underwriting platform, and Ian and team are reconstructing the overall front end. Uh, next year, not quarter four. Next year, we think we should see, in percentage terms, it's a small business. In percentage terms, a growth from that business which should be materially higher than what the firm will record. But again, absolute terms, given the size, not very material. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Rajiv. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rajiv from City. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. 
just one question yeah, if i look at your executable order book or order intake it looks really good uh, robust but at the same time if i look at the headcount it is only up 2% yoi and the utilization is almost at its peak level how do we connect all these three data points so this is the first quarter of the value you would have seen us not adding to the headcount and that's largely because in the last four to seven quarters, we very consistently kept our utilization low. Today, given the fact that when the market is joining the issue, so joining the issue, the number of people who are actually joining after the offers has gone up, and it's gone up almost 20 to 25 percent over the last three to four months. We felt confident enough to be able to take that uh, our utilization up by 300 bits within a quarter, which both you and I know is a further driven shorter quarter, right? So that relieves a lot of people that we could get into the billing pieces. Uh, for us, starting Q4 once again, you will see the same cycle which has been going on for the last eight to ten quarters continuing. Next headcount will go up. The second thing I want to point you to is uh, when we talk about headcount reduction. Most of it in the current quarter was led by the mortgage BPS business. It's not a very material business, but it's a business that we do largely move to volumes, and we have to react very, very quickly to volumes going down. So last two quarters has been that over and Otherwise, where we stand today, I talked about this in my commentary as well, we have a thousand GDTs, graduate engineer trainees who have either completed training or are undergoing training, and it's a six-month training in our case, and are available to to build any time, right? So we're not short of people who will be needed to start the last in 51. And starting to fall, you will start seeing the net account back on, on the credit continue. This was a utilization correction order. It's been a very significant jump in utilization in a seasonally weak or no return quarter. Next quarter onwards, we try to keep utilization at around 80, 81, possibly take it a little bit more, and the rest is obviously going to come in by headcount. Sure, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashri Dash from Mirror Asset Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, so, Shuji, uh, when you spoke in your initial uh, remarks, you talked about retail and public uh, subject. Sorry to interrupt so, you, Mr. Dash. Uh, the audio is not clear from your line. Please use the handset mode. Okay, just give me. Hello, is it audible? Better now? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. So, so that you, in your initial remark, you talked about uh, two sub verticals, retail and public, and you expect that to perform well going ahead. So, just want to know what type of what growth you reported in those sub verticals in Q4, and what is the outlook going ahead? So, Abhish, uh, this is the first time we arrived when we called out the contribution. We are not calling out the growth numbers on a quarterly basis in this quarter or in the quarter to come. We will scale up a little bit more. Outlook, uh, we think it's positive for both of them. We like to think very positive, uh, which is why we are planning to carve them out at some stage as standing on verticals to become vertical number four and number five for the organization. Not even anything else to that. Over there. Nothing for me today. Thank you. Covered it well. Okay, uh, got it. Uh, so my second question is on uh, your TTH vertical. So uh, you reported a large deal in uh, Q1 FY23. So last two quarters, you have not talked about any deals on TTH travel vertical. So we have uh, good quality. The, uh, good competencies in TTH segment as well as uh, uh, client base also looks strong. So uh, again, I just want to understand like, uh, are we winning deals? Uh, the, how is the deal momentum in the TTH vertical and what kind of uh, growth you are expecting in FY24? So uh, TTH, this year, should be uh, and I'm talking TTH more from a North American and Europe perspective. Uh, we are anticipating uh, 
pretty robust growth, uh, 25% plus, and I'm talking down numbers at a current point in time, which is from that inception. Not working very well for us, you're right, last three quarters we haven't uh, declared on the TV in large scene, but the farming engine, something that John drives for the organization, right, has continued to chip away very, very efficiently. Uh, travel transportation obviously rebounded both the passenger side and the cargo side. There seems to be a lot of confidence and a lot of commitment around strength going up. So strength are going up. We've been riding that wave, we've been farming. We have used the COVID period to rest wallet share in many cases, become the only partner in a client situation. So we've been riding that wave, we've been going through the farming engine on the travel side. It's not as if there are no large deals that are person we are, but we have done the report over the last report. Okay. Thanks. So uh, that's it for my Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hitain Chain from Invesco. Please go ahead. Hi, Sudhir. Uh, uh, one question. Uh, so how, how do you think about the margins over the medium terms in the next two to three years? Now, uh, given that uh, there are definitely tailwinds uh, on the supply side, you've got one of the lowest attrition in the industry. At the same time, the growth is uh, looking quite strong. Uh, so it depends on how do you think about investments in your business. Uh, do you think investments will accelerate from here on, or do you think operating leverage will be good enough for you to continuously report margin expansion going forward, given growth continues to be strong? I think we are very committed to margin expansion. Uh, we, we don't believe that growth for the sake of growth is the only, is the only uh, goal that we should be going after. There are three things that give us a lot of confidence and which have allowed us to keep investing even in a time like this when macros are uncertain on the margin front. First is what I called out, our offshore revenue as a percentage of overall revenue is now 15.5%. The offshore factory has grown very significantly. Our CQGR in the last six or seven quarters for offshore revenue has been almost 8%. So that structural even needs, along with the increased utilization, along with the pressure factory, the GDP factory that is working, we think we should be able to move the margin, margin needle materially. The only call, the execution call that Ajay and I have to take is when does one actually start getting the, when does one start moderating investments and getting the, some of these margin levers start impacting the bottom line. This quarter, and I talked about this earlier in response to a question which uh, has come from the IIFM team. Gross margin is already not a very significant thing. So it's more a question of margin. At what point in time do we stop this very aggressive investment in sales, marketing, and capability? We believe, I'm just trying to make sure that I characterize this correctly, we believe that uh, even as we stand as a firm, there are enough levers for us in the short term if we wanted to do a material uh, uptick, drive a material uptick around margins. Uh, so, a year or two years down the line, margins should be up. We have done a planning exercise where we planned around what we should look like at a billion dollars, roughly where we are versus a two billion dollars. And we would expect the margin profile to be superior, significantly superior, at the two billion dollars given the operating levels that we find. Again, we do like to change this and add some more color around data. Uh, sure, uh, sure, Sudhir. Uh, as as, uh, 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 as we have seen in this quarter, our gross margins have, have improved, but we've also done an investment. And as we go ahead in the near future, at least we will accelerate those investments uh, and, and keep investing for future, for future growth. However, as we mentioned, we will take the call on when to rein in those investments and start expanding the margins, and that 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 should happen in in a couple of uh, in one year or from one year onwards. Great, thank you. No, no, it does give me a lot of color. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, operator, just keeping a time check here. We have uh, uh, time for one last question, please. Um, and then, of course, we'll uh, we can individually follow up with everyone uh, who has any questions. Uh, Thank you. Water. We'll take the next question from the line of 
Abhishek Shindarpal from Incred Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for accommodating me and congrats on a good quarter. Uh, sir, just one question. It seems that, uh, you know, broadly uh, for the quarterly earnings, we are hearing that, uh, you know, the vendors have been able to defend uh, vendor consolidation deals better. Uh, any color in terms of who's losing right now in the market and, uh, you know, any particular uh, mechanisms in terms of pricing, delivery, you know, what's, what's working for, uh, you know, generally our vendors? Any color could be really helpful. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that would be very, very successful uh, over the last uh, few quarters, uh, quarters of years is actually being uh, the ability to uh, translate our internal uh, sales data into the business outcomes. Uh, and that's something that we've been really proud of over the last few quarters. Uh, the reason for that is that you know, we've been able to translate our internal sales data into the business outcomes. It's really resonated well with our customers. Um, obviously, we, we, it's all um, based on a very, very strong execution bias on delivery. But what we have actually uh, accelerated has been the, the use of consulting, consulting-led um, uh, solutioning, and, and this has actually played a significant dividend in the positioning of us of our customers, and also the types of conversations we're having with the customers, and actually how we can then take that to uh, to, to close on deals. Ah, thank you. That's that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Subir Singh, CEO and Executive Director, GoForce Limited, for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's, uh, it was early morning for uh, for most of you in India and for uh, and possibly getting me finding a joint over from the States. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your suggestions and your comments. Uh, you've always said this and you've always meant it. Um, the insights that you offer me not to us, they help us significantly. Uh, once again, thank you very much for it. And once again, uh, very, very happy new year to you and yours. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of For Forge Limited, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.